Hello and welcome. Um, this evening I'm very fortunate to be joined with my good friend, um, Father Pascal Uche. How are you doing, Father? You all right? Yeah, very well, thank you. It's lovely to be here. Good. So Father's a priest of Brentwood Diocese in, in uh, Essex in England, which is my diocese. And uh, I've asked him along this evening because um, he shares something with me. We've both been involved in a bit of street preaching, haven't we? I know that's one of the yeah. things that you like yeah. getting involved in. Um, and I, I wanted to start a series of videos. I'm going to try and do a series of videos with various people um, who are in, engaged in real life evangelization. So who understand the challenges and uh, and basically the message. What is the message that we're trying to get out there? And this is based on um, a number of conversations I've had, which uh, revolve around the fact that the problem that the, the, the greatest challenge, I mean, I've found it as a catechist. I don't know. I'm sure you'd agree, Father, but I'd be interested in your perspective, is that um, like with the kids, especially with young people, when you're talking to them, they don't know. They don't know anything about Jesus. They don't know anything about the gospel, why it's important. And there's a real apathy because they have perhaps have been to a Catholic school and they think they do know it. They're, they're convinced right. that they do know what Christianity is all about. And that leads them to a sense that, well, I've heard all that and it doesn't mean anything. Um, and that causes, a, you know, apathy. The other thing is that when people have been involved in the faith for a long while, uh, a cedia can set in, can't it? Which is that sort of sense of, just going through the motions where you lose interest is that would you right. say that's your experience as well definitely and you know just as you said that i just thought that that's the wisdom of the church of the different that, have you that as well yeah. Sorry, uh, I, have, I have yeah i have yeah i've definitely experienced that um and i i feel like i'm part of that and there was a great excitement in seminary because there was a feeling that we want to go out and change that we don't want to go into parishes and do what's always been done um, because it needs it needs a shift, it needs a change, and I think we're responsible for our parishes, our areas, and whatever else. And and I've also seen where it has happened, like where there has been life injected into places. This is what we've been made for. And so when like the gospel hits our hearts, um, we do come alive. And so there's been instances of seeing that, uh, which gives me great hope. You're right, there, Mark. That's brilliant. Yeah, so I think there's a bit of a there's a bit of a choppy yeah. signal at one end or the other. It'll all be okay when it evens out because it this the way that we do this it records at source, so we should be okay. But there's a there's a bit of a gap, so I might okay. have to edit it out at the end. So that, I think one of the reasons why it's valuable to have this conversation with you in particular is because you've got that hunger. Um, you like you've you acknowledge the importance of the gospel for people's lives that it's transformative mm -hmm. yeah exactly and i've seen that myself first mark like even way before seminary and um that took me into seminary the desire well just seeing the lord work in my own life mark in my own problems and my own troubles the lord really saving me you know i don't think about salvation in books i think of the lived experience of jesus lifting me up from a difficult place and giving me hope and giving me courage and um, what I've experienced, I want other people to experience, you know, uh, something I've tasted and seen, basically. And, and I think we just need to be more explicit with it. This is like why Jesus came. <laughs> and so we Do you don't think that, that would be a bit of a fairy story to some people, like in people are so cynical? We, we, yeah, I do, I do think so, so, Mark. But we have to be ready to be fools for Christ as well. And so even doing this conversation, it just reminds me about that central um call isn't always a popular one you know people might not take it seriously in fact when saint paul was preaching they said i will hear you about this again when he talked about the resurrection there were people that walked away and thought talking about right a, a dead man rising from from the dead i think uh we need that courage again to lean on the holy spirit and be like well this is the message we were given and we don't want to share something less than that and sometimes i think we try to sell or share something less than that, which is safe, but it's not going to produce the fruits because it's not the gospel, you know. Um, the, the gospel is radical. It will ask everything of us, but it gives everything to us, you know. Um, all the grace here and eternal life um, in heaven. So, yeah, I think we definitely need to step out of the comfort zone. I'd, I'd say that. 
which is what happens when you go out onto the streets. Excellent. Okay, so, yeah, definitely. It's exciting and a bit terrifying. I've had <laughs> really uncomfortable. So uh, the way I wanted to start this thing, as I briefed you before, we is to um, share, this is a brilliant article by Professor Larry Chapp, who is a retired professor of theology who taught for 20 years in Pennsylvania. Um, and he, he he's written, he writes all the time in a number of publications, and this is in Catholic World Report. Um, and so basically he goes through this and he's looking at um, the causes, you know, of, of what we're, we're seeing. And he starts off by um, outlining that decline as he sees it in, in the USA. And he says, a new study released by the Pew Research Center indicates that 29% of Americans self-identify as having no religious affiliation of any kind, and only 63% of Americans identify as Christians, which is 12% lower than just a decade ago. This is just the latest indication of a trend in America towards greater secularity that has been fermenting in the word of the American way of life for about a century or so. The situation in Europe is even worse as a broad and deep secularism has supplanted Christianity. Among the historic populations of old Europe, even as Islam rises exponentially due to, to immigration. Um, one of the things that I often find when I talk to young people about the faith is that they've got this idea that everyone is secular. Have you seen a similar thing? Well, that's the, the norm, where you don't really expect people to, to believe. So that would definitely be like the norm now. Um, the idea of like being completely secular, I guess, is also being like celebrated because uh, we should all be able to be who we want to be uh, and go the, the roads we want to go. So it fits in more with that. Whereas I guess if you, you claim to be something, a Christian, and you, you stepped out and, and kind of went to a more traditional kind of worldview, that's not maybe seen as, 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 as in keeping or as like expressive. So I do see uh, a trend of that. How do you tackle the thing that is like, you know, well, we're all climbing up the same hill and everyone's got a right to believe what they want to believe. Do you, do you think that that's the right attitude or do you think that, you know, there is truth, objective truth, and what we're trying to do is share the best way to live your life? Well, as you say it to me there, I'd want to challenge that person who's saying that, you know, like because we've been made for God, I'd want to challenge that person like, do you really believe like you're living the fullness of life? Is there a hunger in your heart for more? I think the beauty and the dynamite of the gospel is because we were made for it, we know when we don't have it. You know, we can know like the the areas and the symptoms that say, well, actually, this isn't f fully fulfilled me. And if you have care and concern for those who are going through, I don't know, depressions or difficulties that come with a secular society, the loss of meaning and all those sorts of things, and you you can't offer something tangible to them, uh, you know, you're in a poor place. Whereas I think what we're able to say is like, there is something concrete and objective um, that can speak to everyone. You know, this just general idea, it might sound nice, but in practice, in your experience, do, are you being fulfilled by, by, you know, the gospel that you've believed in or like, you know, the, the story that you've been told? I suppose so I it's difficult to, with... It's difficult with young people, especially, isn't it? Because they, they've got a tendency to look up to pop stars and media stars and, uh, you know, like fast cars. And this is what, what they think is will bring them fulfillment. But when you look into the lives of those people, you regularly see that they are on a journey, a spiritual journey, seeking, trying to seek the truth for themselves, don't you? Trying to fill that hole that St. Augustine says. Sure. But I wonder, Mark, and maybe if they, they, there's the fear of like what it looks like to, to follow God. You know, um, the saints talk about sometimes we have the wrong image of God. And so with the wrong image of God that we run away from him and we run away from the faith. And so perhaps it's not that people feel that the world fulfills them, but they don't have the right image of the Christian faith as well. And so they're not attracted to that. And we, we might find people who, um, yeah, that the, they haven't got a good image of God. Or that's a Christian brilliant faith. point, isn't it? I, I suppose that's what Bishop Aaron often says, isn't it? When we, we met together, didn't we? When we, we saw Bishop Barron in London and Bishop Barron was saying that we've abandoned our intellectual legacy really as Catholics, right. haven't we? In an effort to reach out to people, it's been a great experiment over the last 40 or 50 years to try and <laughs> dumb down the faith 
to try and make it more um you know approachable to people and that's really seems to have been disastrous doesn't it yeah it hasn't you what you want the faith that calls you up and and things that have dumbed it down have just made it like not really credible as much it's been um, a disservice to young people who are great in so many areas of their lives and they aspire for much in so many different areas in the area that matters most the salvation and well-being of their soul um we ought to give that the same if not more substance so that people really feel that they can climb and uh, begin to ascent to something i mean that was a norm at some point there was a point where christianity like they understood that this was the, the greatest life to live and if we could get on that spiritual road that's the, the best way of investing your life uh we're far from that <laughs> i'd say yeah uh, and that's like the threefold spiritual path isn't it that you're talking about there the Purgative. Yeah, the yeah. unitive. And the, yeah, exactly. So, and, and that, um, once we understand that, it's interesting because in my conversations with uh, evangelical Christians, this is one of the things that they seem to be searching for. I've mm-hmm. done all the stuff. Where do I go now? And it's that lack of a sacramental ladder or not really understanding what the next thing is to, to move on um, that, that causes them an acedia. It causes them to sort of become bored and eventually fall away from their faith. Sure, sure. Whereas when you've got that lively challenge, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. I know it's a little bit unrelated, but I've got um, a friend of mine and her son's in the school and he's brilliant at maths. And when he gets to the end of his maths class, they, they, they give him colouring in. And she's, she, you know, she's kind of really upset at that because what's colouring in? He, mm. he's, he's great at maths, take him to the next level. And I think we ought to, in the spiritual world, think about holding how we calling people up and I know that the article speaks into that when it, you know, about holiness towards the end and that call. Um, yeah, perhaps we won't. That's, I think that's, it's, it's a beautiful thing about this article. We won't, perhaps we won't go through the whole thing. We might not have time, but we'll do as much as we can. Sure. So to move into the next bit, which I think is really relevant, especially in the parish environment, um, Chap says, what are we to make of this? We can start by acknowledging that this is nothing new. The recognition of ecclesial de- decline in the West is now as old as Cardinal Newman's sermons on the dangers posed to the faith by modern liberalism. Along these lines, I have always been partial to the literally to the literary diagnosis of this same disease in the novels of George Bernanos. The reality of what we face was powerfully encapsulated in the opening page of his masterful 1936 novel, The Diary of a Country Priest, where mm. the young cure of Ambrecourt, the saintly hero of the story, says... Mine is a parish like all the rest. There they are, all alike. My parish is bored stiff. No other word for it. Like so many others, we can see them being eaten up by boredom, and we can't do anything about it. Some day, perhaps, we shall catch it ourselves, become aware of the cancerous growth within us. But you can keep going a long time with that in you. Now, I'm I'm not familiar at all with uh, the author, I have to say, but um, I am familiar uh, living in a... I'm, I live in a wonderful parish, but still you see that creeping in when you're trying to to do work with the with the parishioners, you know. And I have to say that what you know, looking at your hot, like watching your homilies online, you like if you if people can look look up your homilies online. And I one of the things that struck me about last Sunday in particular was um, that it's quite a different approach that seems to really engage people would you, would you agree does that does it engage people do you find they're more engaged with your <laughs> preaching style uh you'll have to ask them and in some ways i <laughs> they don't get a choice because um i usually it's part of my like nigerian background or cultural background i usually start with a bit of a song or something to to kind of um just actually engage people but no i, I think um the thing about boredom is is an experience that many people have many young people have and i remember being struck mark by the words of Bishop Fulton Sheen, he says something along the lines of like, love doesn't get bored. You know, boredom is a sign of a lack of love. You know, love is on fire. It's, it's, um, it's risky. It's um, interactive. It's engaging. Love like calls us into life. And so that boredom is a symptom that like, where's the life of the Holy Spirit? Uh, you know, where, where is that? And I think that's beautiful to recognize it first of all and say that, this isn't 
This isn't Christianity. If it's just like going through the motions, that's not what Jesus Christ gave his life for. You know, we are his bride and he calls us really um, to be alive. And so I think boredom um, is a symptom that something's not quite right. Um, yeah, and the word of God is supposed to, to, to bring life. The word of God is alive and it's supposed to bring life. In fact, it was the first reading today. He says, <laughs> the Lord talked about his word. Yeah. Is never John 10, 10, isn't it? I call you have life and life to the fullest. There's that one, but also Isaiah 55 in today's first reading. He said he sends his word forward and it always brings fruit. And, you know, we, we've got to ask ourselves, are we really receiving that word and are we allowing it to yeah, bring? Yeah, I love that. It's always. That, that was the big thing for me always was about efficacy, you know, and I think it's very much related to this topic because the thing about, that I used to think as a young man was, what does it do? You know, what does it actually do to be, what does it actually mean to be a Christian? Yeah, it's nice to go to mass and sing these songs and all, but I couldn't see what actual effect. There was no connection between the gospel message and people's lives. And that was also something that I noticed in the community that I was living in, was that people who purported to be Catholic didn't live lives in accordance with the gospel message. Sorry. Sorry about that, Mark. Don't know what happened there. What happened? Did you drop out? No, it just, it just dropped. <laughs> uh, hopefully that you're able to like marry yeah, that we'll up again. It together. Where, where okay. did you get? Where did you get up to? Did you hear my little you said bit you were, there? You were trying to say to see what it actually does when you were young. You were trying to see what does Christianity actually do? Yeah, what effect it had on your life because. And my experience was that, especially as a young man, it was like, you know, I was quite affected by the scriptures, but I found that, um, you know, the, the, the prevailing attitude, say, for example, in junior school, it wasn't a Catholic attitude. Every, in fact, everyone was very much acting in contradiction to the gospel. And so you kind of think, well, you know, what, what's the point of all, what are we doing here? What's the point of all this? Sure. Sure. And I think sometimes that's why if there's a second i could just make a comment yeah please. sometimes that's why we see young young people um especially growing up in east london i use the phrase uh that they bleed out to some of like the pentecostal and evangelical churches where there is a sense of like what gets done whether that's like the more supernatural stuff in terms of like believing god for miracles or powerful preaching of the word of god manifestations basically of what they read in the scriptures being translated into their lives. And, um, you know, when we read the lives of the saints and we look at church history and to think about the martyrs and whatever else, there was such a lively faith. And so there's a real sort of um, disconnect between what we've received, actually, in terms of the faith and what we're actually living. And if we put that in front of young people again, you know, what? how awesome it would be to be confirmed and know that actually I'm in the line of the martyrs and that's what I'm called to do. And to really believe that, uh, because it is a time for martyrs in, in a different way. But um, That's interesting. Yeah. And, and it's lex orande, lex credende, lex vivende, isn't it? Basically, that's mm -hmm. exactly what it is. And the way that we pray and the way that we live um, is revealed. Um, sure. So, in a, And it should be revealed in our lives in a really obvious way. So why do you think there is a definitely, that makes perfect sense to me, how have we ended up here? Have we ended up with this incredible disconnect? I, you know, something that I'm sure that you guys have referred to, it's, it's the gradual thing, you know, and it's the work of the enemy. We're in a spiritual battle, but gradually we've been pulled away into this kind of very comfortable place. And those, uh, you know, what we've been comfortable with is starting to fade away itself. Cultural Catholicism is not sustainable because that's not the desire of God to have a culturally uh, Catholic church. He wants one that's filled with the spirit and not just there because my auntie was there or everyone from my country goes. So I think cultural Catholicism, you know, caused um, potentially um, for us to get into a very comfortable place. And it's like the frog in the water that was boiled slowly. So we've got to that place, I think, just by um, conceding as well and just 
becoming lukewarm over time. And we know what the Lord does with the lukewarm. So, yeah, um, spits them out. Good. Yeah. good. Okay. So um, going back to the article again there, Larry Chap says that the boredom that Bernanos is referencing is a unique kind that is peculiar to Catholic communities. So I, I'd be interested if you think that this is as incisive as I do. Um, Catholic communities that have, be, that have incrementally and silently abandoned the faith in sacrament as a, encounters with Christ, which is exactly what you were just saying, wasn't it, like the boiling frog? That faith has been replaced with a secular simulacrum wherein the outward form of the sacraments remains, while the inner life has been hollowed out and replaced with a banal ideology of a deeply channelized and profoundly intolerant cult of self-fulfillment and material well-being. Wow. We see this. It's really good, isn't it? We yeah. see this everywhere in today's anodyne, suburbanized Catholicism, now made safe for the culture of the cul-de-sac. Even most of our churches built since 1958 look like those cul-de-sacs, round, self-referential, and aesthetically drab in their cookie-cutter, concrete, brutalist minimalism. They inspire nothing and spiritually provoke even less. Designed for liturgies which seem designed to induce an anaesthetized sonambulance, their wide doors of modern aluminium and tempered glass have become the exit turnstiles of no return. He doesn't pull his punches there, does he? No, not at all. <laughs> There's the Lexa Randy for you. Yeah, exactly. Lexa Randy right, right there. Um, really a powerful term there about the hollowing out because um, i tell you one way, place where I find that, and I'm guilty of it as well, that you'll come out of mass perhaps or something and, and the conversation just turns to the world. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, you would hope that fresh out of mass and whatever else, you know, we could really be sharing about our faith and whatever else. So sometimes I find that just interesting that no sooner is mass done, than mass is done, you know, when we're, you know, we're moving it back into, into the world. But, um, well, there's that attitude that people go to the, you know, like, I mean, I, I don't experience it among people so much in my parish, thank God, because I think one of the things is that Father Kevin works so hard to deliver beautiful liturgy, which engages people. And therefore, mm -hmm. that it's the longest mass, it's our 1130 mass, which is the mass that has the most reverence and incense and all, that draws the most people in our parish which mm -hmm. i think is a real success story in itself and it shows you know how the, how this works if you make it beautiful people will come sure. you know and it's the, it's those transcendental ideals again isn't it of the good the true and the beautiful and um, that's what people want to see so it's really yeah. interesting. But when I was, I was going to say, I remember, especially in Ireland, when, when I was, I think it's still the case in Ireland, that people go to the quickest mass, you know, they want to get it out of the way. It's one, mm -hmm. And that's like the Saturday night, the vigil mass is often like that, isn't it? It's like the one people want a free Sunday, so they get it out of the way on Saturday night. And it shouldn't be like that. It's, you know, I've always tried to introduce it to my children as this is your opportunity to worship God. This is the one sure. hour yeah. you get a week to focus uh -huh. entirely on our Lord. As as to say one or two things, I know that um, in a joint friend of ours, Anna, in her school, they've got a quote from Jose Maria. So it's not that the mass is too long, but your love is too short. And so when people bring minimal to the mass, like it can have the opposite effect. You can feel like I just need to go straight away. And so... I've seen that. And as you know, I've come back recently from uh, some time in Nigeria where a two, two and a half hour mass is a norm. And and people are happy to spend that much time in, in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. Um, and it was a real challenge to me to see how half an hour homilies, there were people engaged, you know, really uh, just taking it all in. So it reminds me that it is possible. And so we do need to sort of fight for it. The alternative is we kind of think, actually, let's go for the minimum. Let's just make everything a bit more like the world and whatever else and not transcendental. And that's not going to be attractive really to us because, you know, <laughs> it's just like the world. And if mm. we wanted the world, we could go out into the world and get it. And so the more we try to be like the world, we can't compete actually with Brilliant. what the world gives. No. We can't compete with what the world does, but we're not called to. No. You're not called to. Like the Lord has given us, you know, a stairway to heaven. Let's get, let's get on and climb it. Brilliant. Exactly. I totally agree. So um, the next bit in this article here is uh, he goes on about the, the fact that um, ecclesial sins 
you know, and he like he 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 says that we keep virtue signalling about it and saying we're going to clean it up, but it just goes on and on and on in the war of attrition, and that connects really well with the idea of saints because what he's saying is, yeah, we're all sinners and all this rhetoric that you hear about the church being a hospital for sinners and you know all this like all the excuses that are made. But ultimately, if the grace of the sacraments, if the idea is the call to holiness is what the being a Catholic mm-hmm. is all about, we need to see that imaged in our pastors, don't we? We need to see holy men to inspire us to be holy and to show us sure. that they can do it. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. There's a, there's a sort of like a hierarchy there, isn't there, of like if we're if you have holy priests, then you will have like a holy or a more holy congregation. Like there is a connection there and God has made it that way. One of my favorite stories is, St. John Vianney, when he was asked um, where the relics in his church were, he went to the graveyard and, and pointed out the people that, that were his parishioners and said, these are the relics, these Wonderful. people who were my parishioners. They're, 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 the, they're the relics. In other words, like he made it his primary concern to get them to heaven. And he believed that they were in heaven, or at least that they had become holy in their life. And, uh, and, and so that, that's part of the... Um, the antidote to what we've got is is like the radicalness of, of holiness. And it's something we should all be attracted to. That's the, it is attractive to me. And it's, you know, we all should be trying to be saints, shouldn't we? And oh, that definitely. seems to be completely missing from the narrative at the moment. Do you not think? Yeah, because actually when you say saints, apart from a living relationship with Jesus Christ, it just sounds like moralism, mm. like, oh, you have to be really good and like, you know, whatever else. But it's about, leaning into his mercy as sinners, but not staying there, letting his mercy transform us um, so that actually we do make progress from Lent to Lent, from Easter to Easter, you know, that we're not the same when we come around again. We're actually growing. Excellent. Well, so um, that little bit there um, finishes off with um, sort of this, I think it's a, a really good bit, you know, where he says, if holiness in the church is always a Pam Lip set, hidden under an overlay of pornographic corruption. He's, he's very eloquent, isn't he? It's hard to see how an average person can be expected to do the work required to restore the original image, hidden under centuries of varnished overlays of mendacity and debauchery, caught between the boredom induced by a church on the move and the perceived preposterousness of the church's claims for herself. Our culture and our church opts for the construction of superficial compromises. And this is, I think, one another in another piece that he talks about the idea of, um, you know, the big tent and accepting everyone and everyone being welcome is a, is a refusal of the Christological reality of the church, which is that, you know, we are broken and we need the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to heal us. It's mm-hmm. to ignore that is to rob the cross of its power. And to say, you know, what they're really saying is, oh, there's nothing you can do about that. You just have to sort of live with it and be chained yeah, yeah, yeah. to that sin for life, don't you? Which is, which is that's, that's not the good news at all. No, exactly. It's something <laughs> you know, in, in, in the gospel, Jesus said the time has come, like, and he talks about the good news, uh, sharing the good news. But it begins with, like, recognising the bad news and how bad the bad news is. Uh, otherwise, we'll never really appreciate what the good news is and, and I think it's not a bad thing for us to go out and diagnose and and point out like where we where we've all failed, we've all fallen short of the glory of God because we have have a, have a savior there. I mean, that's surely when we got ashes on our head, you know, a couple of days ago. That was part of it. It was a reminder that we're dust, and to dust we'll return. Words that God spoke after the fall, but then promised us, you know, salvation. So let's turn to Him. You know, that's what the cross tells us. We've got a saviour. So Larry's answer to all this is basically is wonderful and uh, thematically obviously draws together with the whole um, centrality of his writing is Gaudium et Spes 22, which is the Christological centre perhaps of uh, the teaching of Vatican II. And so he draws it all together into this um, at the end of this essay. And he says, uh, put into eschatological categories, what we're confronting in the world today is theodramatic confrontation, wherein there is an increasingly visible prolepsis of heaven and hell playing out in conflict in the very souls of every one of us. And its resolution can only come about Christologically, since only Christ can be that point of contact. 
this much modernity has laid bare and made increasingly clear. So I remember when I was doing, um, when I was studying, one of the lectures we had was a brilliant lecture where uh, the incarnation was, we were taught was, um, you know, the the point of contact where where God is reaching down to man, constantly seeking man, and man is searching for God. And that point in history is the incarnation. And that really struck me as something incredibly wow. powerful, that mm-hmm. idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously that, and, and that's, that's what Chap's doing here, isn't it? Definitely. And he's, that powerful is our thing you're talking about, the theodrama, that it isn't just about myself and my own sort of ego drama, but this is actually the drama of salvation, a God who's reaching out and touching us. And actually the stakes are really high. He, he's calling us to, to eternal life. And that's been worked out in our life, in our day, you know. Um, yeah. So he, he finishes it up here. It's Christ or it's nothing. And it is in the threshold between Christ and nothing that the saint must live, since Christ is the bridge that alone can cross that threshold. This then is the true accompaniment that we need today to combat the decline all around us. The accompaniment of one who, in Christ, can bring a foretaste of heaven into the domain of those in the grips of hell's shadow. We can lament the decline we see, or we can chase after those who are fleeing, like the shepherd in search of lost sheep. And, by chase, I mean the pursuit of friendship in a higher spiritual turnout. Mm. We must be able to live in the in-between and to bridge it in Christ. This is the time of the poets who speak the language of paradox, but in the concrete singularity of real things. Long gone are the Baroque romantics. What a pity. But perhaps our own era might yet generate a new form of the sanctified romantic, for only such saints can make Christianity weird again. Here is what I find Pope Francis to be both unbelievably attuned to the need for the church to move out of itself and into the metaxu of engagement with our world, the church's field hospital, but also unbelievably obtuse as to what this means or how it is to proceed. His response seems to hinge on emphasising the path of empathy with those, because of sin, who are in the prolepsis of hell, but without bringing along heaven as a restorative remedy. He has lost the Christological point of contact and has opted instead for the mythology of a modern globalism and modern latitudinarianism as the true empathy. As such, this papacy represents to me one of the greatest missed opportunities in the modern church. What could have been a papacy of energy and sanctity for the sake of the world out of the heart of the church became instead a papacy fixated on quasi-Marcionite theology that pits the angry god of doctrines and commands against the kind god of antinomian love. And it's a shame. It's a shame because it gets diagnosis correct, but not the prescription. Okay, leaving the Pope Francis stuff aside, <laughs> that's a beautiful <laughs> thing about accompaniment, isn't it? And um, you know, like the uh, like what it really means to accompany someone to bring heaven into the prolepsis of hell uh, that we're experiencing. It's it's very very powerful. Uh, the Christ or oops, a bit too close to the screen here. Uh, the Christ or nothing kind of image that he gives um, is beautiful because it's like you're introducing people again to the real drama of their lives. Um, when you told me about this, what came to mind was there, there was a beautiful document that John Paul II wrote for young people, and it's based on the rich young man. And he says it's who the rich young man was brought him to Christ, but all the stuff that he had, the possessions, took him away. But the drama... If we're inviting people into the drama, how can you be bored at mass when here is the very real presentation of Calvary, representation of Calvary in front of your eyes? And actually your response to that is determine your own eternal destiny. Hmm. Like if if you're brought into that drama, I think it's a beautiful word. You you can't be bored again, which kind of is what his point was, that it's the boredom that sits in, which, you know, if we're all just going to heaven or... There is no heaven and like nothing really matters. Then we can't be surprised that this is the response. Mm. But as soon as the stakes are revealed to be what they really are, we can go out onto the street and have a chat with someone. And for me, Mark, the beauty of it is, I know we were talking about street evangelization. Yeah. Because I don't know. I, I've been so fortunate on street evangelization. You meet people who have real hurts, real pains, whether they're worldly or spiritual or whatever else. And to be able to speak about the God who knows them and loves them, you can see in their eyes that is there really a God that knows me and loves me? Mm. It can sound almost too good to be true. Mm. But I think we have to have the 
kind of audacity or the boldness to go out and do the diagnosis stuff, which is like, actually, it's not all good. And then offer the prescription. This is where he ends with them, which is like, there is a God who gives real mercy and real grace in a concrete way in the sacraments. Be baptized, come to new life in him. Be nourished by the Eucharist. Be sustained by the word of God and journey with like the saints towards heaven. Like, um, that article challenges me, actually. I've not been out in the streets for a while. Maybe I need to get out soon. Well, I think we've done a, a pretty good job here tonight, <laughs> hopefully. Well, and one of the things that um, comes across most clearly, Pascal, from knowing you is that you do believe it. So it's that we, when you talk to people, when you evangelise people, you're bringing that to the conversation. And that is, you know, so that authenticity is so important and so powerful the, the transformation that you've experienced in your own life is something that you're offering to other people, isn't it? That's Well, pray um, for me anyway. Pray that I can, can be that witness in, in what I do and whatever else. But the words of St. Peter, like, to whom else should we go? You know, uh, what else is there? Absolutely. So, thanks for the article, though. I definitely have to have a deep read into it. And I'll set, Yeah, I'll put the link in the show notes here and I'll send you I'll send you that. There's a, there's a couple of other really good ones as well from him. So good, good, good. Listen, thanks ever so much for joining us. And please, ever, all the viewers, pray for Father Pascal, um, who's doing a brilliant job in Chelmsford. Um, and obviously, we'll see you soon. God bless. Take care. God bless. Yeah, right. See you Take later care. on.